Right. Um, welcome everyone. I know not everyone is in yet, so I'll leave a few minutes for everyone to pop in. I'm Isabel, I'm the founder of Ally Networking, the mentoring and networking initiative for the creative industries. Um, we run a series of online events like this one on all sorts of topics around the creative industry, soft skills, hard skills, negotiations, how to make events, how to create brand partnerships, all sorts of things. And since January, we started a membership scheme, which is uh, at the moment run on Slack. You can sign up from 850 a month or you can apply for a bursary. And part of the premise of the membership is that will give or like help our members who want to go into moderating or public speaking or creating events, give a chance to do them. So we did one with our member, Nikki, who did a music networking session with us. Amelia, who is our, me our member who works in fashion and fashion history, curated a series of events for London Fashion Week. And now Hope, who's here with us, uh, is starting a series of events around publishing but potentially things that she doesn't like events and topics that she doesn't usually see anywhere else that she really wants to talk about so I'm really really excited to do this and I will take sort of a back seat at this point um just the final sort of announcement that our mentoring program opens for applications on the 22nd of March and Lauren, who's here from the Feminist Press, is one of our mentors this year. So really excited about that as well. Uh, with that said, Lina and Lauren, thank you so, so much for being here and sharing your time and your expertise with us. I will let Hope introduce herself, and then Lina and Lauren will introduce themselves, and we'll get started with the conversation. During this time, please pop in any questions you might have on the chat. We'll try to get to all of them at the end of the event. If not, we'll figure something out. Please also let us know where you're from, what you do, uh, put any links to you know, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, whatever it is, so that you can all connect. We always encourage everyone to use these moments to network and meet other people in the industry. So yes, I guess that's all for me. So hope the stage is yours. Thank you, Isabel. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Hope, and I work as a communications executive at Picador. So a lot of PR marketing work, and I also work with I like networking as a member and ambassador. So that includes kind of running these events and just spreading the word about the initiative and the mentoring scheme and that kind of stuff as well. But particularly really excited to be working with them to bring forward these series on publishing and just talking about things that we don't really get to talk about as an industry like for example this event came about as an idea because I've always wanted to kind of maybe move on and kind of try publishing in another country and working with different systems and learning a lot more about the industry beyond the UK so this is how this event came about and I'm so grateful to be joined by Lena and Lauren. Thanks Lena would you like to go ahead? I should have said that. <laughs> yes yeah. hi um so I'm just gonna say a bit about myself, um, although you might have read the bio. So my name is Lena. I work at the Children's Division at Penguin Random House UK in the Rights Department, and I sell rights to our children's books to foreign publishers. So uh, normally rights is divided by territories. So I sell into Asia. Uh, Chinese specifically is one of my a language skill, so that's one of the reasons why I do that. Um, specifically about my career, I used to work at Penguin China, so I lived in China for six six years and uh, worked for Penguin there for three. I am German, born and raised, and I lived there for a while, obviously, and now I am in London for about two years now. Worked at an independent publisher before and now at Penguin for a little under a year. Hi everyone, so happy to be here. Thank you Hope, thank you Lena. 
Thank you, Isabel. Um, I am Lauren Hook. I'm currently the interim executive director and publisher of the Feminist Press. The Feminist Press is a nonprofit independent publisher based in New York City. So hello, it is two o'clock in the afternoon for me <laughs> on a rainy day in New York City. Um, but good to, good to see you all. Um, uh, we turned 50 last year. Um, 2020 was not the year that anyone expected, um, but for us as a small press, we were really reflecting on 50 years of legacy and history and where we go from here. We got our start, you know, providing texts to the burgeoning women's studies movement of the time. A lot of lost literature works that had gotten out of print. For example, you know, we published Alice Walker's amazing Zora Neale Hurston reader. Um, and that was before Zora Neale Hurston was, you know, part of high school curricula in the U.S. today. Um, and so we were really looking for these kind of recovered classics texts. And we still have that mission today. Um, and we also publish a lot of contemporary cutting edge feminist voices. Um, and yeah, really, really an exciting time to be in feminist publishing, but to be in publishing in general, which I know we're going to discuss. Um, I've been at the press for almost seven years now, and I, I'm excited to have this sort of international conversation because at a nonprofit everyone wears a lot of different hats we're really collaborative everyone is really helping each other and I've had sort of an interesting career background you know I started out as an editorial assistant but I also you know mentored with someone who did rights at the press and so I've been going to London Book Fair I've been going to Frankfurt for years um, working with sub agents um, I have great editor friends around the world and it's really it's been such honest like a, a great community on WhatsApp to tap into this past year since we've been missing out on fairs and things. So excited to be here, excited to answer all your questions. Thank you both. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and start with some questions and feel free for everyone to just pop in any questions you have in the chat and Isabel will get around to them. And first question before Lena. So you have worked in different locations, you've studied in a different country and it's just really incredible. And I guess my question is, can you share what that's been like? Like, What's your experience from having that opportunity to be able to speak, I guess, different languages, work in publishing, and how has that shaped the early stages of your career to the now, I guess, mid-level? How has that been for you? Um, yeah, let me try to put that together. I think for what I'm doing at the moment and what I have been doing, it was, it was always about what I was curious in. So as background, I have um, a bachelor's in China studies as well and have a master's in Chinese politics. So there, it was always something that I wanted to do. And in a way I've, I've kind of sought out the jobs that would go with that. So what I really liked, for example, what came together in Beijing, Penguin, uh, China was that they A looked for somebody in the English department and B for somebody who could work with translations. So there was an aspect of me being able to speak and read and write the language, but also being able to speak German, uh, English, sorry, and German, that helps sometimes too. So I, I, I sought out jobs that would, that would sort of align with my skills, I think. And then now that I'm in London, it's sort of also that again. So I'm, I'm, I looked for rights jobs that specifically wanted to work with Asia so I could use my, my experience and I could work with the things that I love and that I want to work with. And I think there was a lot of like following that curiosity. And I was very lucky that I could actually find the jobs that would align with that. I know not everybody can always do that. You know, you have to pay the bills and all that. But um, yeah, I guess like following ideally things that I was curious about. I think that's what I wanted to do always. And luckily until now it has, it has worked in China, has worked in, in the UK so far, knock on wood. That's incredible. And I love the phrase you use, which is to follow your curiosity. That's really something I think a lot of us should think about more often and try if we can to work it into our career trajectories or even just general life advice I really love that so thank you for that advice and on that kind of following your curiosity I know Lauren you work at a smaller feminist press and working at a smaller publisher slash indie house means 
there is a lot of room for curiosity and also a lot of room for wearing multiple hats. And I believe you do kind of like foreign rights as well. That's one of your many hats. And how have you found that working in the States? And I believe you have a background as well in kind of uh, worldly studies. So Spanish, Latin, Latin Caribbean American studies as well and international affairs. So how has that kind of influenced, I guess, your work? I really related to Lena what you what you were saying. This sort of like early international curiosity. My um, my mom is actually a, a commercial airline pilot, and so you know she raised me, and we were always traveling um, because of the perks of being a pilot. I would highly recommend everyone in this call go get your pilot's license. <laughs> um, and I mean maybe after the pandemic. Um, <laughs> And so early on, I had this great exposure um, to, you know, work, like life outside of the States. I was moving constantly, former Air Force brat, and in, in college had really amazing mentors in the then Latino studies department, um, studied abroad. And I was always really interested in, in books. I mean, everyone here, I'm sure, um, but really international literature and how when you go abroad, there's so much, there's so much English language literature there. So there's so many works that are translated, but here it, as everyone knows, it's like 3% in the US, maybe creeping up to four of literature is published in a year as works in translation. And so I was really interested in international literature as not only like a way to travel, but to build bridges and to build empathy, which I think also not only in an isolated time like this, but obviously with the rise of, you know, fascism around the world and what we've seen in the past several years, like empathy is key. Um, we're not really communicating or connecting anymore. And so books and really, publishing books and stories from, you know, all around the world, all different types of experiences was really important to me. And so Feminist Press was always honestly a dream job. Uh, we have a history of publishing global feminism since the start. Our founder, you know, did a whole Women Writing Africa series, Women Writing India, just publishing works from all over the globe. And so that was really something that my passion project that I brought to the press that as I started getting my feet wet in acquisitions, you know, as a young editor, I could really have the space to dive in and take the initiative to say, well, have we published a book from Thailand? No, why is that? Like, have, have we published a book from Equatorial Guinea? Where is that? Who? No, okay, let's do it. And let's have that be a queer coming of age story, you know? And so really pushing the envelope of the kinds of representations that we're seeing, not only in literature and queer literature, but in translated literature as well. And so, I think that's my, that's kind of why I get out of bed in the morning. Um, but, you know, having a sort of international acquisitions passion and lens is really great with foreign rights, because then when you get to go to all these fairs and fellowships, I sit down across the way from a publisher and I'm like, buying or selling, I, we do it all here, one stop shop. Um, and so there's just a lot of synchronicity and these kinds of like, communities you find yourself in. You're getting to meet international editors, you're getting to see the same books kind of shopped around, around the world. Um, and so I think they, there's a lot of overlap if you're lucky enough to work at a house where you can kind of combine those passions. Definitely love that. That's really, it sounds so great. And it sounds like getting out of bed every morning sounds like a dream like having something to get excited about and be curious about every day like there's something new to explore that's really cool and I guess and working I think, from home I don't know if any of us actually get out of bed to work anymore but <laughs> anyone in bed like I, I support you <laughs> <laughs> and I think you touched on something quite important and it's like it's kind of we're leaning towards a kind of a darker time in our history like the uprising of far right and I guess really damaging opinions and I think in publishing we've been seeing kind of it's kind of like um, a simmering pot really of everything coming to the top as we know publishing moves quite slow and so over the past year we've kind of I think in the UK in the US we're kind of talking about the same thing so pay transparency for the junior roles mid-level roles um, talking about Black Lives Matter, like Black staff in publishing, and then it goes beyond that into other um, minorities and other capabilities. So are we providing for people who aren't able-bodied and so on? And I was wondering how has that affected how you publish? So it also comes for you, Lena. Has that kind of overtone affected your work with foreign, like foreign territories and other people outside the UK? And for you, Lauren, what's it like kind of being, I guess, in the middle of it all as well in the US, that part of the conversation? Lena, do you want to take it or do you want me to go first? Uh, I, I think, do you want to go first? I think in, in light of what's happening in the US. 
Yeah, I mean, God, we've used the the term reckoning, really. I mean, last summer, uh, it's just incredible. Hashtag publishing paid me. Obviously, all of the marches for Black Lives Matter. Um, These incredible appointments, historic appointments like Lisa Lucas or Jamia Wilson, who, you know, was my boss for the past four years, is is now at Random House, the executive editor. It's 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 really incredible. Um, And at Feminist Press, like we're a mission driven publisher and, you know, everything we do, every acquisition, every hire, every fundraising campaign has to go back to this mission. And, you know, for us, it's creating this world where everyone can recognize themselves in a book. And it's been that way for years. And it's exciting to see mainstream publishing catching up. And I think I, I want to really believe that it's it's not just lip service and that it's not just a moment, but that it's true systemic and structural change and commitment. And it's not just some high profile hires, but that it, they're actually gonna do the work. And that's internal, that's at every level. And it's you know raising salaries to a living wage in New York. I mean, again, I don't know how it is in London, but you can't have three unpaid internships and then get hired as an editorial assistant and make $32,000 in the city. I mean, a certain type of person would be able to do that. Um, And so really expanding even who we think of as a candidate to be an editor or or a publisher, going beyond the MFA model. um, It's an exciting time. Um, It's, you know, long overdue, I would say. Um, And something like, I mean, we've even seen it as the feminist press, like think about the past 10 years and what feminist as a, is it an F word? Is it, a, is it something on a t-shirt? You know, Beyonce, like, like what, like, what is it? How is, how is the culture reacting and responding to feminism? Like, I swear when I got hired, like there were these articles posted and published, why do we need a feminist press anymore? This sort of post-racial, post-gender world, which we know to be completely false and just indicative of white supremacy. And then look at what happened with the past few years and where we are now with the cultural conversation um, and especially anti-racism studies. So I think, you know, this is something on our minds. I really believe it's our mandate to seek out those voices who for systemic reasons do not find themselves in print. That's why we exist. And that goalpost is always going to change depending on what the larger culture and the larger big corporations find viable right, find meaningful. And so I think I think it's an exciting opportunity. I, I am so happy, obviously, like my former boss is like making bank and like making like, like these glam seven figure offers and I'm like, get it. Um, and I just, I hope that it's not just a hashtag, a moment. I really hope that people do the long-term work. Yeah, I, I can only second all of that, especially, um, I mean, what happened in the US just recently and it is something that we all need to we all need to be better and publishing like you said hope is moving so slowly sometimes frustratingly slow and um, there is really I really hope this is not just lip service like you said Um, we're seeing this so when we talk to our foreign publishers there are these conversations at different levels in different countries so there is difference and we're trying to try to address it and say these books that I'm showing you, they are really good stories. Please have a look. I can't make anybody buy something for their market, but I can have a good conversation about it and I can try to make sure that they see all of it. I think and not dismiss something from the get go because if I believe in the story, there's much more likelihood that I can sell it. That's what I love about my job is if I can bring a book and publish it together and then make it sell well, that's good for the author and the illustrator and especially in children's books, there's so much work to be done for kids to see themselves, like more kids than right now. And I think it's really something that we all need to be even better about. That was absolutely perfect. And I think leading on to my next question slash point, which is how would you say for yourself, Lena, that having this kind of international career, having the ability to kind of navigate the world with this kind of lens that you've experienced a lot, how does that kind of, does it make talking to people outside the UK more like 
advantages like do you do you think it makes your job a bit easier do you think that kind of selling to different markets was what is free is it for you quite difficult or quite hard how would you say you navigate that it's definitely it's definitely an advantage I think and it's not only me I think because especially my expertise right now is very focused in my job so there's not a lot of like I wouldn't call it my comfort zone. It's not my comfort zone every day, but it's something that's very tailored to my skills. But if I talk to other colleagues in the team or even other teams, it is always an advantage if you have, and I don't want to, yeah, like I don't want to make it too generic Instagram quotey, but if you looked outside yourself before, so if you talk to somebody, especially publishing that has a different market or a market that is structured differently or looks for different things or has different buying patterns, even or different price modules or different channels. There, there's so many differences. And I think speaking of being curious about uh, where you sell to and who you're sitting across from, like Lauren said, um, having that empathy is a big word in a commercial context, but I always want to know whenever I sit down with somebody, I say, how are you doing building that rapport? And then how's your market doing? How's your business going? Because we both want the same thing. We want to publish the best books. So um, it's, it's a nice camaraderie and it's a nice like purpose in a way, if you want. It's still a commercial purpose, but it's also an artistic purpose because you want to get that author out in the world. And the Vietnamese publisher wants the Vietnamese kids to read it. And I want the author to be available in Vietnam. So I think it's a nice, it's a nice way of knowing that we can, we can interact on a, on a different level. And then there, there are more aspects to this. For example, I know that I have to speak differently and I have to choose my words differently, like in a fast paced like book fair environment, not everybody is a native English speaker. I'm not a native English speaker. So I speak differently. I have a slight, not so British twang to it, but sometimes it's helpful in meetings. So there's these little things. And if you know not to kiss a Chinese publisher on the cheek, you know, it's, it's a little things, you know, whereas you know that the Spanish really like that. So it's all these like little things that you get to know when you watch other people, you watch other meetings, but also, you know that you yeah maybe it's that like being curious how it's done well I think it's we're coming back to being curious I think I really like that as a I guess um, theme for tonight's chat it's really good and I think it kind of leads us to the next point as in some people I guess have that advantage of studying certain languages or doing certain degrees that give you that kind of international scope but what if you're someone that is just let's say London is your hometown or another regional town is your hometown and you want to go big explore and really branch out of that I guess small mile radius that you are in at the moment how would you advise someone who's in their youth looking to make it in publishing but wants to kind of start thinking about an international career, how should someone go about starting to like plant those seeds and make that career happen? Well, I'm not an expert on the UK dialects, but I would say if you can distinguish between different accents or dialects, you already know more than one language. So think, believe in yourself. Don't think you're not a language person. There's always, if you're, if you're really looking into this, and I do believe, unless you want to go to the US or Australia or New Zealand, really, um, maybe South Africa, you would maybe need at least one more language or a bit of a language, let's say it like that. But yeah, so many people say, oh, I, just, I can't do it. Like I'm not a language person, it's not me, it's too hard. I would say, try it, you might be surprised. There's a lot of fun aspects around learning just words. I mean, just, yeah, if you, if you start looking into it, it might, be, it might be actually a lot of fun and you learn, you can, I mean, you can start watching uh, K-dramas or listen to K-pop 
and that's fun and that's a different language and there you go you might want to know what they're actually saying and then you go down the rabbit hole from that but generally don't be discouraged if it wasn't something that was taught in school or is not something your friends really do um looking into it and maybe just asking yourself first what you're interested in what sounds interesting to you and then taking it from there I mean, I did the same in Chinese. I didn't speak a word of it before I started my bachelor's and I was intimidated <laughs> and it was so hard. But I've been learning Chinese for 13 years now and I'm not done. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a thing that you can do. It doesn't have to be that massive as Chinese might seem right now. But I think if you really, if you really want to, go outside of the UK look in, look into it make it fun in the beginning and then you see that it might come easier to you than you think yeah I was just gonna say um you know I, I studied Spanish in school studied abroad and I think if you can to actually relocate in some way whether it's a, like a scholarship program a study abroad to actually immerse yourself you know that whole like oh, I don't like sitting in a classroom and like conjugating verbs all day like I get it <laughs> Um, but then when you're actually maybe breaking up with someone in another country over the phone, like that's, that's where the language really clicks. Um, it becomes like a muscle memory, it becomes a lived experience rather than- I just sense the story. I sense the story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I was going to say also Netflix has so many amazing international shows now and putting subtitles on and, and oh my God, there's just amazing entertainment to be had. Duolingo apps. Yes, also drinking is a great test. Comedy, honestly, if you can go to a stand-up comedy show in, in another language and like get half the jokes, you pass. Can I say that like a random interruption? I 100% feel you, Laura. Like for, the, for a long time, I was like, do not invite me to stand up. I do not understand what's happening. Like I can go to the theater, but stand up is like not a thing. Uh, so I think it's definitely a test. And I also sent myself to exile to Kendall in the Lake District when I was younger to learn English. And that really worked. I did not understand what people said to me on the phone ever. But yeah, I remember the first time I got drunk and spoke English and I was like, oh, progress. So I vouch for those tips, basically. <laughs> Even when you dream in another language, there's all these like milestones that people talk about blackout drunk or dreaming or whatever it is you can get there flirting yep <laughs> it's, a, it's oh, about sorry. getting rid of inhibition really <laughs> I think there's a lot of stories that you tell yourself I'm not that person well maybe you are have you tried <laughs> and this has actually made me think of something quite interesting so we're talking a lot about maybe going to something quite um I guess unforeseen, un unexpected, and you're not sure how to navigate it. But let's say there's someone who's English speaking moving to another English speaking country. So let's say I go and start working publishing in the US, in New York, let's say. Lauren, how would you say, how, how is the US publishing, I guess, operation? How would you say it differs from the UK? And how, I guess, what's your experience of working in the US? And can you have, do you have any comparisons or? I guess, notes to share about US publishing. It's such an interesting time to be having this conversation too, when like I can't even go to London right now. Like, you know, even if the book fair, is that book fair happening in June? Um, like, I don't know, TBD. Oh. <laughs> um, but again, I, I represent the indie niche side of publishing here. And um, so with, even in the UK, I've worked with a lot of indies in the UK. And just even if we're having, uh, maybe we're, we're co-publishing a book, simultaneous release, maybe we're collaborating on marketing, whatever on the lead up, I've noticed that just in, I mean, in general, obvious, the US market is a lot larger. Um, and there's just also a lot longer lead times whether it's print, getting a book printed, like I need minimum eight weeks now because of the pandemic to get something, which is like wild to think about. And, you know, my friends in the UK are like, oh, I'll have it in a week. And I'm like, oh my God, that changes everything. Um, and also just, you know, thinking about like media and, and pitching and just in general, like it seems um, 
maybe a little easier to like rise above and get some like I know there isn't the same kind of dedicated book review coverage so that's like I think something that's unique um but in terms of like getting Guardian versus like us getting the New York Times there's a there's a lot of competition and obviously that book review space what we do have is so great but then it's also shrinking um so I think just the, the scope of it of the market the sheer number of books is honestly mind-boggling and I, I feel like this little fish um, but then hearing my UK counterparts, it just seems like a lot more agile, like it just like shorter term line and, you know, you're not locked into something like however many months, years out, like in my mind, it's already 2023. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I always kind of comment on. I always feel like I'm talking to people who don't work in publishing and where they don't have like massive time schedules and I feel like I'm living in 2025 but the year is 2021 I'm like how do I cope <laughs> so it's quite um, it. yeah <laughs> for a lot of reasons <laughs> and I think you touched on something there about um I guess we have these different systems and I feel like we haven't touched on the pandemic yet in this conversation and I was wondering how I guess how has that affected the kind of more international sides of your job so let's say Lena you'd probably be going to things like maybe Frankfurt or Bologna possibly that kind of thing and yourself Lauren you also do a bit of foreign rights and I guess there is some travel involved in guests looking for both stories outside of yourself your own experience that kind of stuff so how has that hindered or maybe offered new opportunities for how you guys publish? Yeah definitely I miss book fairs oh god <laughs> It's, it's weird, like I've, yeah, I've gone from 100 to zero, which was weird. And also I changed jobs right before it. So I was at Nosy Crow before, which is a smaller, more quite, like they're getting bigger, quite medium um, indie children's publisher in the UK. And we've, I've counted, like I, I was there for a year and a half and I was away every month. So we went on sales trips and book fairs and other things. And then the pandemic hit and then I changed jobs and at Penguin, it went to like zero. And it's really hard to keep connections like that. So especially when we rely on just seeing people, seeing publishers and, and making those relationships work. So that was really hard. Zoom, a lot of Zoom. I did a lot of, well, time difference uh, situations where I got up at 3 a.m. and did two book fair days because I needed to see all my Chinese publishers and there wasn't enough time in the day. So we did that and it was great. And they really appreciated that. <laughs> and I had a lot of coffee. <laughs> but generally, um, making it work despite that. And you can actually see how strong your relationships are because people are checking in and seeing how you're doing and um, sales. I mean, the worst thing for us as a publisher is that bookshops are closed and uh, we see that with our with our customers our foreign publishers and their bookshops are closed and they have different timelines and then we want to make sure that they can fill their publishing schedules and some just said I'm sorry we're just we're just condensing it we're not adding anything right now and you need to adapt then your own schedule and there's there were a lot of moving parts and it was really difficult but also quite moving because we were, all, we were all supporting each other and we were all checking in and seeing that everybody was okay so yeah it was quite it was quite challenging I, I agree this this industry is so relational and you know whether you're an, an editor buying international fiction or you're in rights or, or an agent it's just seeing the same people over tepid coffee for 30 minutes twice a year or <laughs> times a year and you you really do learn to you know like who gets your list whose taste you trust more than others or, or like you know Lena, like you were saying sort of like more cultural things that you should keep in mind um and just years and years and years of seeing these these same people and so last year just really everything everything ground to a halt and you know people weren't buying anymore people were canceling their publications for you know a, a greener pasture sometime in the future which never came um and just everything was slowed down I, I i as a reader wasn't you know reading as much because i was just like we need to get the books out the door into the printers before they close um i was a uh, 
I was supposed to go to Finland last year on an editorial fellowship. Um, and there was all these amazing international editors. We were all gonna meet and learn about the Finnish market, meet with publishers. And they we had a nice happy over, over hour over Zoom. So too much Zoom again. Um, and, and in the US even like when, when we're not just thinking about Frankfurt or London or, or Bologna, like, you know, a week before everything shut down, we were supposed to go to AWP, which is a big writers conference here. You know, it just there's so many conferences that are in person with booksellers, and booksellers have been really hard hit here. Librarians, uh, oh my god, academic conferences, uh, regional conferences. Uh, you know, having our authors go to like Miami Book Fair or Texas. There's all of these really amazing events and venues and. It was hard to pivot. I think I think now people are having online conferences successfully. Would love to hear everyone's thoughts on this. Um, whereas a, a while, I think there were people were really struggling to like make. You can't just read to a Zoom room. Like like, like there, there's a format that I think really works. And I think now like Crowdcast versus Zoom versus like all these different programs. I think we're figuring it out. But there's also deservedly a lot of fatigue. So. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I love that you've highlighted, I guess, or both of you, that all the amendments you've had to make kind of as an industry and job-wise, the things we do on a daily basis turned on their heads and then reimagined into something else in order to get books out. And I think that's so interesting. And something that I like hearing sometimes is when you're talking to people about the pandemic and you notice certain things you couldn't do before have become possible. And I guess it's that's the flip side of it, such as, having international authors at events and festivals when you usually had to fly them in, pay a lot of money to have them stay somewhere, that kind of stuff. Definitely. That's absolutely incredible. And someone I admire a lot, Charmaine Lovegrove, who's publisher at Dialogue Books, has just done a whole move back to Berlin during a pandemic. And I think that's something quite inspiring. And I was wondering what advice would you have for someone, I guess, going back to that kind of planting those seeds point earlier, how would you do that amidst a pandemic? What kind of moves can you make, I guess, to kind of start building up this international career so then when things are a bit more, I guess, we have more of our freedoms back, let's say that, how would someone go take, hit the ground running, I guess? I definitely, I heard about Charmaine's uh, move, I think on social media, that was quite impressive. Um, I would say, so let's say you want to go to the country, right? And, and work there. Um, definitely, I, I mean, it depends how you go about it. I think right now it'd be great to establish relationships first because right now you can't even fly into some countries if you're coming from the UK, I think right now. So work with what you have. If you can't even get on a plane, think don't force it <laughs> so establish relationships and what I always think is best if you want to work abroad make sure where you want to work that they need you and that they need your skills I mean you're probably fortunate that you're a native English speaker I'm assuming our audience might be um, so but also make sure that where you where you have your eyes on the publishing house or the industry or any kind type of company or institution that they have a department that could benefit from what you can give like don't assume you go there and say i'm oh, marketing exec um well you have marketing so hire me <laughs> i think if you look at it and see what they're doing and if it's your skills then start to start to uh, talk to the people there or follow their social media, be aware of what they're doing and try to get in touch with these people. Be prepared for emails not being replied to. <laughs> be prepared to, to not get that many answers right away, especially now, but establishing yourself in that space and knowing what's happening, what are the best sellers, what's working well, what are they trying to accomplish? and how you can fit into that. As an example, at Penguin China, they had an English department. They wouldn't have hired me in the Chinese department because why would they? Because they have amazing Chinese editors for that. But because they had an English department, I could add to that and I had a Chinese literature background. So in that way, making sure that your skills fit into where you want to go and then do your homework, do your research, 
try ideally talk to people there and say listen I want to do this do you have any advice normally people are very rarely say no I don't want to give you advice I think that's a bit of like doing the research just acquainting yourself with what you want to do in that country uh, what you can do and that might lead to even different things that you haven't even thought about right because when you talk to people or you see other things and maybe go down certain research rabbit holes you might end up somewhere completely different and yeah I think that's it's a good way to go right now is to uh, use your time on social media which I'm, I'm guessing is plenty right now mine is too um, <laughs> to maybe look at look at other other parts of Twitter other parts of Instagram and look at the bookseller publishing perspectives is great has great international articles and you can go follow from there um yeah make sure that you have this amazing skill that will add on to what they're doing right now I think that's that would be a good hopefully successful route to go yeah I think there is an opportunity to be had right now uh purely from an accessibility standpoint um I think you know in in the states publishing has just been really hunkered down in New York. And if you weren't willing or able to relocate yourself physically, you know, fat chance. And there were, you know, a couple of exceptions. And over time, there are more little indies popping up and things. But the pandemic has basically that like myth that you need to be chained to your desk in this office from nine to five, otherwise you can't successfully do your job. It, it's been proven to be a myth because here we are a year later and there are many amazing books coming out in the world and you have heard about them and they're not printed upside down, et cetera. And so we can really kind of challenge this idea of, you know, where we're based, um, whether it's for, you know, you're in another country, ability, whatever it is. And I think as, you know, the pandemic plays out throughout this year, like, are we ever going to go back to the office full time? That's the question. Um, and we're seeing like larger publishers have more hybrid models. So I, I think it's an exciting time. And so for someone getting into the industry, I think there really could be an opportunity, whether it's applying for internships, you know, in a more aggressive way, like to another country, another state, another part of the world, whereas before they, they wouldn't even open your email. And now it's like, well, actually, like, like, whether it's I have an author on a Zoom event from around the world, why can't I have, you know, freelance, I have to work with a freelancer or like work with an internship or something like that. Um, so I think freelance work, also internships, like maybe take a risk and apply in a way, in a more aggressive way. Um, because I think also uh, uh, we all really need a lot of help right now. Um, you know, the last year has been so hard. We've just like, we didn't have time to really reflect. We just had to hit the ground running and pivot. Um, and so I, I know people that reach out saying like, hey, here's what I can do for you. So what Lena said, like <laughs> seeing what like your skills are and what, how you might be able to help and being proactive and communicating that, excellent. Um, I also think like networking, coming to events like this, uh, book Twitter is amazing. Follow all of your favorite writers, follow their agents, follow their editors, follow the publishing houses um, that release their, like your favorite books, these publications that Lena was mentioning and just kind of join in the conversation, go, go to an event, go to like, I, I mean, I, there's like such amazing indie bookstores in the States and, and so many of them have like really amazingly adapted to the virtual event space. And it's, it's not a snooze fest, it's fun. Like it, the chat's going off, like it's fun. And, you know, so it's like 7 p.m. on a Friday and I'm like checking on on my Zoom. So I think social media is just another way. You're gonna start seeing the same faces, the same people popping up and you can engage. Um, doing your homework as well. Like if you're wanting to work in publishing, publishers are really different. They have really different structures, lists, mandates, um, but also everyone wants to work in publishing to be an editor and not everyone is an editor. <laughs> so what do you actually want to do? I mean, there's pros and cons to being an editor. There's a lot of amazing positions. So I think also kind of educating yourself that way, whether it's hands-on experience through an internship or an entry-level position, like an, a mentorship opportunity, like I like networking, you know, or informational interviews. I do think, you know, folks are busy, um, but like Lena said, people like to talk about themselves and give advice. <laughs> so, so try, try to make those connections, especially if, you know, you can tell when you've been BCC'd on like a big spam email, like make it intentional, you know, make it detailed, show that you've done the work you'll get through. Uh, Lauren, Elena, you just like said everything that we used to say on the networking events I run. So I think I don't have to do any of them anymore. I 100% agree with that. 
um, you have to go and talk to people. And I agree, Lauren, there are so many ways to communicate. And I always tell people that when you're on social media, you have to be authentic. And, you know, like the other day, I messaged like this author that I, I love what she does. And I wrote to her like, oh, you wrote this book about, you know, the specific thing. And I saw this topic that popped up, made me think of this. And we engaged in a short conversation on Twitter, you know, and so it's like, there are moments for you to reach out to people and it doesn't matter how big or small usually they are they'll tend to like one day Billy John King responded to an Instagram comment you know what I mean so like you guys can dream big I mean I don't know about Beyonce and Obama but almost everyone else maybe um but I think we should do, do a few where it's like quarter to seven and I know we have to let everyone go so Hope, should we do some of the questions from the audience I'll let you do you want me to read them out or do you want to select the ones Sure, let me that just make more sense. Look. Yeah, I'll let you. I'll let you do that. Um, but yeah, I'm really enjoying this conversation. I'm learning a lot. Uh, and Lauren, I think we also did a, an event with one of our other mentors about that on the other sort of sectors that exist within publishing, and you know what you can learn from marketing, and you know like production. I mean, hope does communication. So I think that's a really important shout out okay hope i'll stop talking sorry it's all yours again <laughs> you're good <laughs> you had a question from kimberly earlier asking about um different markets and i was wondering if either of you could share on maybe an ex a market that you're really well versed on and what kind of books are popular there and I guess what they like to see in their literature shall we start with adults because mine is children's <laughs> I mean things I guess I can just like say like what's been selling here um and and again I have a really niche list so it's really interesting going to fairs and meeting with publishers all around the world and have them say like this would never sell people don't care about women or like just like saying things and you're like I disagree with you. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I've heard it all. Um, we know we, we we published this really amazing manifesto, Raging Against Fat Phobia um, by Virgie Tovar. You have the right to remain fat. And I can't tell you how many publishers were just like, but that's unhealthy. That's not healthy. And I, I sold so many editions around the world because it's a phenomenal title, but there's still so much prejudice and just like misinformation um, about what like, body positivity, but beyond. And so also seeing like what books travel anyway, um, it's a lot, but in general, I've been noticing that resistant self-help titles flying off the shelves. And I definitely under the Trump administration, but also I think during the pandemic, people don't always have the ability to focus. And so having kind of something accessible in short form, it's also cheaper. Uh, so it's accessible that way. Um, but kind of people just want to say like, how, how can I feel better? Whether it's like, how can I cr continue to create art, create art? I'm facing burnout uh, or whatever it is. So I think, you know, just thinking of like resistant self-help for sure. And then anti-racism oh my god exploded last summer and I, I mean for us like little did we know how historic the Juneteenth would be but we had for years planned on publishing a book called Parenting for, Liber for Liberation which is based on a podcast about how to parent black children from a place of liberation and not out of a place of fear and that was our Juneteenth book we had no idea what kind of Juneteenth it was going to have and you know summers are traditionally are slower in publishing for sales and it was it was amazing because people were really thirsty for these resources and you'd go to bookshop after bookshop and like because independent bookstores also are just really amazing like community resources for education just their whole windows would be filled with only titles by black writers and not even just about trauma or just about anti-racism like a how-to guide but also about black joy romance like Stacey Abrams is a romance writer like just all of these really amazing titles and experience and that still hasn't gone away so knock on wood yeah, I can only agree. I mean, publishing is in a way trend-led, but also I suppose there's a there's the metaphor of like, is it a window or mirror, right? Of of what we want right now um, and what we are thinking about as as people. 
um, what kind of books we're buying, but also what we're seeing on the shelves. So publishing is interesting that way. My former colleague always used to say we're selling, um, we're selling culture. We're not selling products in a way, which I think is a bit of a lofty idea, but I like that. Um, so in terms of markets and what's selling, um, so children's books are really specific because there are pictures attached to it. So we have picture books on preschool books, um, nonfiction. There's the visual element to the text and the topic. So it is a quite interesting thing to work with. I can only recommend looking into the children's book industry. It's so creative. So if you have an eye for this, or if you really just like to be surrounded by art, look into children's publishing. Um, for China, for example, it's quite famous um, for being very much interested in educating their children. So anything that is informational works really well. Um, that sort of transfer of knowledge at an age appropriate frame. Um, really good nonfiction always sells. So that's for China children's books, for example. Love that. That's so completely different. And I can imagine people working in other markets have a lot more to say on this topic as well. So that's really quite interesting. And we have a question here from Catherine, who's just asked, um, for Lena again, sorry. Um, she's curious to know, how has your previous editorial experience influenced your rights work? So has it had a benefit and any kind of crossover tips from that? Mm -hmm. Loads. It's so beneficial. Um, I can really recommend. I mean, normally it's the other way around. I think everybody, like Lauren said, a lot of people want to be an editor. And it's great. And I've done it for a bit. Um, and it is a lot of fun. Is not the non plus ultra. Can you say that in English? Yeah. Is not the be all and end all of things. And I, for example, was really interested in using more languages and not only working in English. And um, rights. I'm so glad I worked, uh, I, I made the transfer into rights. It's, it's so much more me and it feels really good. And, but also being an editor, <coughs> excuse me, I swear it's not COVID. <clears throat> being an editor, you get to know the process a lot more. So in a publishing house, it's so confusing. It has so many steps in the process until you actually see the book in the shop. So as an editor, you get to know what is being done beforehand and in a way rights is what comes afterwards and in between so it helped me massively I knew a lot more about what entails a book and I have to sell books also in something that's called co-edition or co-printing so I have to know I have to explain what finishes are on the cover like there's so many acronyms that I want to get into but the fact that I knew that before was so helpful and if you ever want to consider moving within uh, roles and publishing, do that and try it out. Maybe do things like secondments, I think they're called. So you can try and go into other departments for a while. I would highly recommend that. And being an editor um, helps you, I think, in almost all other departments because you sort of come from a place of more visibility, if you want. That sounds great, thank you. And we've got a question here from Katie B. I'm going to read this one, this one quite out because it's quite long. So Katie has asked, do you feel like a publication is a medium of curatorial activism, the aim being to address systemic issues and further the required conversations to promote modernism and the necessary change, not just nationally, but internationally? How successful do you feel books have been in the past year in educating and enlightening people on modern systemic issues? That is a great question. That's a huge question. Good luck, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, your turn. Katie, um, <laughs> sucker bunch of a question. No, that's that's a really important question. And I would not work where I do for an institution like Feminist Press if I did not believe that books could change culture, change people's minds and educate. Like, like you know, you were saying we could sell culture. It, it, yeah, and, and underneath that, I mean, there's 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 so much there. Uh, I really I really do believe that maybe I can't you know change my conservative relative's mind on X political issue, but if I give them this novel, 
and you know representing this other experience outside of their own could they come to their own conclusions it's has anyone watched Shit's Creek? They created a world without homophobia and like, it's like a comedy and like, and how moving and beautiful is that? So I think, yes, you're also use a really great word curatorial that there is like this gatekeeping model of what books make it into print, who are those people making those decisions? What are the processes like and what kind of unconscious bias goes into that process? And so I think really in, interrogating it's any editor publisher or whoever's job to really interrogate like how am I reading this why am I not seeing value in it or why am I putting more value here and really like what are the books that then get championed accordingly um and so yeah I I think it's it's really political I think it's political about what books are on the front table of your store I think there's a reason that certain books are there versus gathering dust in the back or even getting returned um and so yes on the flip side I think in the US, like it's hard to not feel really fearful and cynical because often and more and more we're finding ourselves in echo chambers and people are really just, whether it's an algorithm on Facebook or, or whatever news channel, people are really only reading or ingesting and then talking to people who then believe the same things that they do. So for New York, for example, is a publishing bubble. And now that New York, that publishing is getting spread out across the country and like, thank God representing the South, the Midwest, like I'm from the South originally. And like all the bias that even I, I encountered because I didn't go to like a Northeast Ivy League school, um, really kind of, again, like diversity at all levels. Um, but really thinking about like, well, even if we publish these books, yes, and get them on the bestseller list, yes. But then can we convince a person to then pick it up and to then to really, can, can we change minds that way? So I, I think yes, because I work at Feminist Press and I'm excited by it. But I also have a lot of conservative family members who are conspiracy theorists and get their news from Facebook. And it's really scary. And so I don't really have a good answer for you, but I, I'm hopeful that books in the long term can create empathy and shift culture. It'll probably just take a while. I completely agree. Um, just looking at, I mean, children's books in a way are a perfect example for trying to plant a seed of an idea. Sometimes it's a silly story, but sometimes it's quite a serious story wrapped up in these very pretty pictures that hopefully um, will no, I don't want to say change kids, but we'll give them some more that they will need when they grow up and become hopefully great people. So I think every time a book goes out there, it should, it should have that choice behind it and it should, uh, not to sound Instagrammy again, change the world, ideally. Um. I love that. Thanks, everyone. We have three minutes left, so I'm going to uh, ask everyone to do their final remarks. Uh, there was a question about freelancing that I think was already uh, answered throughout the session. You can also apply to work with uh, Lauren on our program for Monday, and I'm sure you can reach out to Lena, who's lovely and has been here and volunteer her time to do this as well. So I'd like to just thank everyone for showing up, for participating, of course, Lena and uh, Lauren for coming here today and our incredible member and ambassador, Hope, who did an incredible job uh, curating this and bringing this to attention. Uh, I like uh, Lena, Lauren, to give any details on how people can get in touch with you, any books you're really excited about that people should be looking out for, and then Hope, uh, please also let people know how they can get in touch with you. Oops. So where's the start? You can start, Lena. <laughs> well, find me on Twitter is what I'm going to say. Um, you can find me under my full name, I believe. Um, I have the very imaginative handle, Lena Sells Books. Um, so you will find me there, DM me, you find me in other places, um, LinkedIn probably too. Um, generally, we have some really exciting children's books coming up. Um, maybe look out, I'm not sure if we're publishing this year or next year. There's this amazing YA book coming out called The Upper World with uh, Puffin. 
that is going to be really, really good. Just put it on your list. Watch out for it. Um, there is a Netflix movie already attached and it's going to be great. But yeah, anytime, reach out, um, DM me. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, Thank you, yeah, Twitter is great for me as well. I, I go by Lauren Rosemary. That's my middle name. So you can find me on there. Um, my feminist press email is just lauren at feministpress.org. Um, I've been super quiet on social media. I don't know how you all are feeling. I've been like, ah, um, but I'm there lurking in the background. So if you get in touch, um, I'm, I'm around. And then, yeah, like, you know, like, like everyone said, like I'm, I'm mentoring for the first time. So anyone who's interested, please these apply. Um, a, a book that's coming out, this isn't until this fall, but I just finished editing it. So I'm really excited about it. It's by a Brooklyn-based non-binary writer named Megan Milks. It's part of our Amethyst Editions imprint. Get ready for this title. It's called Margaret and the Mystery of the Missing Body. And it's a mashup of Babysitter's Club, Girl Interrupted, and Aliens and Anorexia. And it's a mind fuck of a novel and the world isn't ready for it yet. And I'm so excited. So that's coming out in September. That sounds amazing, Lauren. And I just want to say to everyone, uh, you mentioned Virgie Tovar. She's incredible. We actually interviewed someone who is a sort of anti-diet activist as well, who's really good friends with Virgie called Isabel Fox and Duke. She's also from the U.S., and we're going to have her on the podcast sometime soon. So if anyone's interested in that topic, uh, wait for that. And finally, Hope, please give everyone, I'm giving everyone a round of applause to you for now, but also tell everyone how they can reach out to you because you also have a really great Instagram account. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so you can tweet me at Hope is Reading. Um, or if talk about books or memes, maybe Riverdale, who knows? Um, you can find me on LinkedIn and you can find me on Instagram reviewing books at Black Book Bitch. One, because I'm black, I like books and can be bitchy. Maybe I'm lying, maybe I'm not lying. <laughs> but um, yeah, <laughs> if you like book reviews, follow me on there. And a book, well, it's already out. It's a book I keep thinking about and it's called Luster by Raven Leilani. And I just feel like it is an incredible book that really looks at a life of a early 20 something really well, a young black early 20 something, that's quite important. And navigating race and just her place in the world. But also this character is quite messy and I live for messiness. So I resonated with that, that was great. <laughs> Amazing, thank you so much Hope. Thanks everyone again, we'll be in touch with a follow up email. And yes, Katie, definitely read Luster because Hope got me into it. And I definitely uh, listened to her recommendations. We have a sort of book club inside the island networking community as well, which is mainly me and two other people who are book nerds in it, but it's okay. We don't, we don't ride. Uh, but again, thanks everyone so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And yeah, if you have any questions, any suggestions, also reach out to us. We are at I Like Networking almost everywhere. I'm sure you can find us. Subscribe to the newsletter. And as everyone said, you can apply to work with some of our mentors from Monday. And we look forward to receiving your applications. Thank you so much again, everyone. Good night and well done, Hope. Really proud of you. Thank you. <laughs>